this is going to be. <laughs> At the very end, I'm going to say how grateful and happy I am to be here. I got a whole, I got a whole thing about that at the end, and um, um, uh, so and I was. But right now, I've got to get on with the very difficult part because of who saw the King's speech. <laughs> yeah. So when I was in law school, I was in a, a seminar taught by a guy who later became. Solicitor General, and he wouldn't learn your name unless you asked a question that could stump him. And I kept very quiet. And finally, he was going on about something, and I said, uh, "No, that's not right. The the Skatowski curve has nothing to do with what with the thing with the point you're you're making." He said, "Well, yes, it does." And I came back and I said, "No, your what is your name? My name is the most difficult thing to say." And I thought, and first I, I thought I'd say Mr. Casey, and I went, mmm, as though considering whether to reply at all. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, I'll say, I'll say Casey, but hard C is very hard. And then I thought, oh, I'll say my full name, and I said, John Casey. And he said, Chiang Kai shek. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> I, I sent a text to my fourth daughter, who's at my house, which said, how are the dogs? Did I buy you the right food? By the way, I got through my craft talk without stuttering. And she wrote back, k k k congratulations. <laughs> Dog's fine. Avocado went bad. Send money for gas. <laughs> the general practice here is to read from new stuff. And I, was, I had turned in uh, the third volume of the Rhode Island uh, trilogy. Uh, and my agent said, we're putting that on the back burner. And I said, but I, that's, it. that's going to trigger a payment. He said, and she said, well, well, why don't you write a CIA novel to, if you want some money? <laughs> you knew all those people. I said, I knew their children. That's not the same thing. I even married one. But, um, and then I, I said, but I've got these craft talks. And, and she said, <laughs> literary essays? Come on, we're talking about money. <laughs> And so then I said, well, she said, anything else? We, we need something. We need something for the fall. And I said, well, uh, the subject that completely bores you. I mean, she said, oh, rowing? I said, yeah. And so I told her a few stories, and she laughed. And she said, she said deal. But so I'm going to read some things from Room for Improvement. The reason it's called Room for Improvement is when in my sort of middle age, I, I thought I, would, I was doing judo, and then I thought, no, no, I, that's, I think about it all the time, so I've got to do something that's thoughtless. So I went in the JFK 50-mile event, and uh, I did it. And I went to the track the next day, and a student of mine was, very, was on the track team, and I went down to just jog a little bit to get loose, and uh, he came up and said, did you do it, sir? And I said, yeah. And so he called this serious long-distance runner over, and he said, uh, this, my prof just did the JFK 50 miler. And the distance runner said, yeah, what was your time? <laughs> I said, 10 hours. He said, room for improvement. <laughs> So there's many pratfalls, but what I'm going to do tonight is something a little different, because I'm just going to read the kind of languid parts of it, <coughs> uh, which are basically being out in the woods and stuff like, like that. Uh, but first, a short account of a, of a real event. I mean, they're all real events, but this, and this is for Dan Groves, who comes from Rhode Island on the doorstep of where this event occurs. There's a little bit of a wind-up. I'll, I'll try and... I'll try and cut it. Uh, yeah, it starts out with it starts out with a long wind up, but we'll go through that fairly quickly. I was offered a job as assistant counsel to the Congressional Judiciary Committee, but by then I wanted to write fiction, so I moved to Iowa to attend the Iowa Writers Workshop. Two roommates and I rented a farmhouse eight miles out of town for $75 a month. 
All three of us played on a club soccer team, and I remember the pleasure of heading in a goal the, to beat Grenell College. But it was the pastoral side of life that I really liked. I love the Iowa landscape. The eastern half of the state is not flat, not if you live in it. There are gentle rises and falls to the land, shadows and brightness in the morning and late afternoon. David Plimpton, a, 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 room, a roommate, ha had wrestled in college and urged me to join him in, in a little road work, just once around the block. Iowa is laid out in, sex in, in sections, each one a square mile, so around the block is four miles. And in addition to this, Vance Borgeli, novelist, World War II vet, and faculty member, taught me pheasant shooting. I, I had a Labrador retriever who, whom I taught out, out of a manual 20 minutes a day until I could send him in, into the field and move him left or right with hand signals. On his own, he would look back. He was a brilliant dog. His only fault was that whenever I shot, he was certain that there was a bird down, often not the case. <laughs> and, and it took a very long time to convince him to give up. Meanwhile, the Iowa farmers with whom I hunted politely looked away. My dog had a vocabulary of more than 50 words, and he finally learned the phrase, I missed. <laughs> Our farmer landlord lived on the far side of the section. He occasionally called up to see if one of us could lend a hand. Farm work, dehorning steers, castrating shoats, loading and unloading hay bales, is interesting and pleasant if you're called on to do it for only three hours. I liked Barney a lot. He worked at a fast pace and, and was a, an efficient teacher. He, he liked Dave and me. He named his two stud boys, Dave and John. <laughs> and I think Barney also stuck up for Dave and me with, with the neighboring farmers, who were puzzled and then put out to see us jogging ar around the section. All that energy just going to waste. So there were many things to love about Iowa, but after three years, I missed the sea. David Plimpton and I were surprised to learn that we'd both been looking at the undulations of the land and imagining they were ocean swells. <clears throat> By then, I was married, and my wife was expecting a baby. A baby. I'd, I'd, I'd been neurotically reluctant to send out anything I'd written. It was time to get over that. Uh, Part-time work on a Senate campaign wasn't enough. Luckily, I sold three pieces. Uh, uh, two to the New Yorker and one to Sports Illustrated before Maud was, was born. My father-in-law ca called to say that there was a very, very small island for sale in Narragansett Bay. He could see it from his house. He offered to put up a bit of money if I would put up some, some the, the remainder to be mortgaged. The price was $50,000. I was feeling flush. And watch out for too much good luck cocky. Cocky about writing and cocky about boats. I'd spent time in small boats. Uh, I'd rowed in a four-oared shell and in fixed seat boats. But I don't know why I thought I knew something about motor boats. The island came with a beat-up six 16-foot Boston whaler and an old out outboard m motor. My wife and I used the whaler to move the wedding presents that, that we'd stored at her parents' house. The next day, my wife and baby Maud stayed on shore at the barn while my job was to get the island ship shape. The first trips in the Boston whaler had not gone well. The cables from the steering wheel to the outboard were reversed so that to go left, you turn the wheel right and so on. And that resulted in a near miss of a clump of rocks, actually called the clump on, on the map. <laughs> I hoisted the motor up to avoid bumping it on a submerged rock. When I lowered it, I pinched one of the steering cables so that, as I soon found out, the boat only turned left. <laughs> Fortunately, we, we hit a wave with, it, with, it, with enough of a bump to shake it op open a panel. Behind it, there was a large button. The label had worn off, but it turned out to be the kill switch. I decided to buy an old rowboat until I got better at, at motors. The, the rowboat was lovely, and the boatyard own owner who built her sold her for a song. She was too long to use as a dinghy for a sailboat, and, and there wasn't much call for a wooden skiff that was too slender and fragile to take it out, outboard. I rowed to the island. When I got to the house, something seemed strange. I couldn't tell what at first. I didn't remember unpacking any, anything, but there were a couple of wedding presents, a couple of silver-plated whatnots, and a cuckoo clock. In the bedroom, 
The mattress had been turned over and lay crossways. It slowly dawned on me that we'd been robbed by pros who could tell silver plate from sterling and who wouldn't take an oddity like a cuckoo clock that could be identified. I rode to Wickford Harbor and walked to the, to, to the police station. Detective Sergeant O'Dell nodded. He said, there's been a rash of houses robbed, mostly summer places, on the water. They use a fast boat. I don't have a boat. You're on an island. You want my advice? Get a big dog. I, I've got a big dog. And get a gun. I've, I've got a gun. Then do what you need to do. <laughs> Did it look like they got it all? No, no, there were some boxes uh, not open. What, what kind of gun you got? A double barrel shotgun. Let me know how it goes. <laughs> I rode out and hid the rowboat behind some bushes. I spent the night in the attic crawl space. I covered the one small window and read by candlelight. Shotgun in Labrador by my side. The second night, I reconsidered the shotgun. I'd loaded it with number two shot, good for geese. Might kill a man at 20 yards. I, I didn't want to kill a man. I switched to number four shot, good for pheasant. After reading another chapter, I thought number four might kill a man at 10 yards. So I switched to number eight, good for quail. It was a calm night, the bay still and smooth. I heard a motor. I snuffed the candle and went downstairs to, to look out a window. A boat just visible against the flat, moonlit water, no running lights. Either they were out to poach clams from Bissell Cove, or they were my robbers. I told the dog not to bark. No barking was part of his 50-word vocabulary. <laughs> I set out for the small beach. I had to go back for the shotgun. I was in highly alert, but not entirely attentive to detail. <laughs> I stationed myself um, um, among the, 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 the bushes a stone's throw from, from the beach. I heard the scrape of the hull, a grunt as someone tilted the outboard up, outboard up. The Labrador knew no barking, but that did not include no growling. It was low and rumbling. One of the men shone a flashlight. I was lit up like a soloist on stage. I raised the shotgun. There was a lot of clattering. Someone banged something, probably a shin, on a gunnel. I couldn't see at all after they shone the, the, the light, but I heard more clattering, then splashing, the hull scraping, then another noise. I recognized it because I'd made the same mistake. If you put an outboard motor in reverse without clamping it down, it jumps out of the water and makes a whine like a dentist drill, like a dentist drill the size of a chainsaw. <laughs> but they got squared away and roared off across the bay. It turned out they'd been avoiding being caught by listening to the police radio. The police would, 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 would say, we see their pickup. We'll wait here till they come back. <laughs> the robbers hearing this would go to their other car on the far side of the bay. The Wickford harbor master figured this out. He was technically a law enforcement officer, but his normal duties were to enforce the no wake rule inside the harbor. He was made for bigger things. <laughs> he loaded his lever action 3030 and went out at night in his launch. He tucked into a cove. After a while, he heard a motor, no running lights. He went after them. Perhaps he used his siren. They didn't stop. When, when he got a beam of their boat, he fired. I heard from one guy five rounds, from another 10 rounds. But both accounts said he hit their boat at, at the, the, the water line. She began to sink. The two men raised their hands. Their usual MMO was to drive their haul to a fence with, within in the hour, but this time there was enough loot in their boat to get them sent up. When I went to see Detective Sergeant O'Dell to report my brief encounter, he made a face. He said, here's what I didn't know last time I talked to you. I, I tried to call you, but you don't have a phone. The harbor master says they each had a Colt 45. But what the hell, sounds like they figured you got the drop on them. I said, the dog helped. I've never heard him growl like that. Dog probably picked up on your nerves. <laughs> the general wisdom confirmed by Detective Sergeant O'Dell was now that the weather was warming up, the summer houses would be occupied, there'd be more traffic on the bay, and of course, the robbers had been caught in a dramatic and widely talked about way, so that all in all, 
the citizenry could now be confident that piracy had been stamped out on Narragansett Bay. I didn't get a fellowship that year, but it turned out the robbery was a windfall. My wife had a list of all the wedding presents. Although it was now much harder to write thank you notes with a straight face, <laughs> the insurance company paid more for them than if we'd got them hawked. <laughs> so life on the island, but that was the beginning of it. Uh, gee, are, are we going to go to the dance at nine? All right, I'm, go I'm going to skip the Irish part then. It's a, it's a wonderful, it's a, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful, it's a oro mafuarin, which, which means, oh, my lovely little boat. All right, I'll skip something else later. <laughs> I've loved small boats for as long as I can remember. Canoes first, then rowboats. Not all, not stubby dinghies, not flat-bottomed, flat-faced John boats, but boats that look as though they can move gracefully under oars. I love the flare and curve from bow to waist, the curve and tuck from waist to stern. On calm water, I like to hear the rustling of the, of the wake, the sound of the oar blades chinking. In swells, I love the way she lifts and settles, fitting herself to the water. When I lived on a small island, I rode a flat iron skiff, much prettier than the name. Seals would come up to her. They didn't like the sound of motors, but were attracted to a musical sound. I'd, I'd be rowing along, and suddenly the face of a seal would pop up and peer at me, just looking. I liked being able to do what fishermen and motorboats couldn't do, row through a field of submerged rocks, trolling a spoon for a striped bass. I held the rod against the stern thwart with the bare foot, ready to ship the oars and grab the, the, the rod if a fish hit. One night, there was a thick fog on, on the bay. I, I was woken up by voices on the south side of the island. The island, by the way, was about the size of this room. Well, a little bigger. I, I pulled on some shorts and went to look. Look, a large motor yacht had bumped into, into the shore. The man at the wheel was looking around helplessly. When he saw me, he said, where the hell am I? Fox Island. He came out of the wheelhouse and held out a map. It was a road map. <laughs> I said, it's a small island, but it does show up on more detailed charts. But look, there's a lot of rocks here. You keep her in neutral, and I'll push you around to the west side. His wife jumped in, and we pushed and pulled the boat around to just off the bit of Sandy Beach. I told him the compass course to the, to the, to the Wickford breakwater. He looked confused and tired. He said, I can't see a damn thing in this fog, and the compass does funny things. Maybe you could come along. But how would I get back? And then I saw my skiff was pulled up on the, the beach. I said, you can follow me. I propped my flashlight up near the stern and rowed. He and his 35-foot yacht followed the light two miles and some to Wreckford Harbor, his engine going, buck it up, buck it up, buck it up. <laughs> I rowed the skiff as fast as I could, close to her top hull, hull, hull speed, a tad over four miles an hour. Um, I, I rode because if it, had I taken the motorboat, I wouldn't have been able, able to hear him if, if he wanted to say something. Uh, also, I was teaching him a lesson. And, okay, I was showing off. <laughs> when we got to the harbor, I did say, this part of the bay can be confusing. He said, ever think of leaving a light on so people would know there's an island? His wife was embarrassed. She said, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're a regular good old St. Bernard. He said, I meant maybe the government ought, ought to. I said to her, maybe I should have a flask of brandy around my neck. <laughs> oh, she said, we don't need any more of that. <laughs> I didn't want to get in the middle of where this was going, so I said, said to him, there's, there's the yacht basin where the light is. There's a couple of empty slips. She said to her hus husband, you should offer him something. I, no, please don't. I love rowing, truly. I said it as a hur hurried pol politeness, the politeness lost in the, in, the, in the hurry. But halfway back to the island, feeling the skiff glide, watching the bit of line trailing straight off her stern, hearing nothing but her and the oars in the fog silence, I thought there was nowhere I'd rather be, nothing else I'd rather be doing, truly. Uh, by the way, the reason you have a piece of line off the stern in a fog is you can tell you're going straight the line is straight, you're straight. And the way you find an island in the fog is you take a compass course to the lee, and when the wind stops blowing on your cheek, you're there. What are we doing next? OK. Um, 
All right. So this now here's this is this is the instructive part. Um, I found so I, I, my editor said, "Okay, write the book," and I and I thought I had a lot of this stuff in the files because I'd been writing for Sports Illustrated and a couple of stuff. And turned out I had just half of it, but I wrote like a, very fast because I had logbooks for all this stuff and lots of notes. And the instructive part is this: the things that I saw that I made brief notes of. Uh, and actually happened to, to me, uh, I find that they came in very hand, hand, handy. Mr. Fairchild, the other night, uh, did a wonderful thing. He said, uh, could, could put together the Bargello in Florence with a machinist shop in Kansas. And those things, and I mean, he, he may have done it because he's really smart. <laughs> and the way it happens to me is, I don't think about it, but these pieces of wandering memory in this kind of loose, cluttered pile of memory just attract each other. Uh, you'll see what I mean uh, when I get around to that. But let's, let's do along the way, uh, which has some funny stuff. The, the other stuff wasn't meant to be funny at all, by the way. <laughs> along the way, along the way. Running, walking, canoeing, rowing. I keep seeing animals. In Pike County, Pennsylvania, there are lots of black bear. I've always liked and admired them, been scared only twice. One time I, I was fishing for trout in, in the Sawkill. I'd caught six, needed one more for a supper party that evening. I hooked the seventh, was playing it carefully as it zigged and zagged, and jumped. I heard a cough. The largest black bear I had ever seen was wading into the stream from the other side, 30 feet away. It had gray hair on its neck and a yard-wide chest. Usually, if you say a few words in a normal voice, a black bear will shy away. N not afraid, just uncomfortable. Yelling at close supporters is not advised. It's likely to rile him. I said, you are very big. <laughs> the bear kept coming. The trout made a run toward me, and I raised my arms to keep the line taut. The bear stopped in midstream, looked me over from bottom to top. One of the bits advice I'd gathered from the guys at the gun and tackle store about a close encounter with a bear is to make yourself look big. <laughs> I'd done this by chance. I think the bear had been attracted by the trout's splashing and hadn't connected me to the trout, just thought the trout was in trouble and would be an easy meal. The bear made rumbling noises. I imagined he was thinking that even if I were eight feet tall, he could still chase me off that trout. My hands began to shake. I said the first thing that popped into my head, I said, you've got all the cards. I felt like an asshole. But the bear <laughs> turned away. He took a few steps. He stopped and swung his enormous head around for another long look. The trout gave up. I stooped to put a thumb in its mouth, my forefinger through the gills. When I looked up, the bear was gone. Whatever noise he made going through the brush was covered by the stream running over, over the rocks. I gathered my rod and basket of fish and walked up the hill, I would have run, but I was hollowed out by fear. The other scare was w when I was jogging on a dirt road and a bear cub scrambled out of the woods just ahead of me. It saw me and then ran up to me like a puppy wanting to be petted. And for an instant, I thought, how cute. But my, <laughs> my smarter thought was, where's the mother? I hoped she was in the woods ahead of me, and I, I turned tail. The cub playfully followed me. I ran faster. When I looked back, at, uh, uh, the, the, the mother was in, in the middle of the road, ambling after her cub. I was glad to see she was ambling. Black bear, for all their bulk, can easily outrun people. I didn't stop for a long time. <laughs> there are very few attacks on humans by eastern black bear. Almost all of them come from a human getting between a sow and her cub. A few come from a male during mating season when the males are in befuddled states of arousal. Another few come when a human is walking a dog. Bears really dislike dogs. <laughs> they'll go after them as often as they'll run away. If Fifi gets scared and runs to jump in your arms, the bear will focus on the dog and you're just more meat. Better tell Fifi she's on her own. <laughs> That's advice that is hard to take. A bear wa wandered on the, onto the lawn in front of the house in Pennsylvania. My mother-in-law's poodle charged it, yapping. 
Luckily, the bear was kind of teenage, probably half grown, maybe 200 pounds. The bear climbed a tree. He didn't use the branches, just used his claws on the, on the trunk. In three half-second moves, he was 30 feet up. If you ever thought you could climb a tree to get away, you don't. Um, just put your fly rod in the air. Uh, he, he sat on the branch, hugging the trunk, mewing with fear. I, I got the poodle inside, but the poor teenage bear didn't come down until after dark. One or two years old, older, the bear would have knocked the poodle into the next county. <laughs> two years younger, the bear's mother would, would have. <laughs> Lucky poodle. <laughs> but the variables are variable. W one of the many disservices Disney movies have done is to make wild an a animals cute people. They aren't. Even the U.S. Forest Service, with its Smokey the Bear mascot, is infected. Wild an animals are better served by Wittgenstein. If a lion could talk, we would not understand him. There are people who are woods-wise who can predict what an animal is likely to do sometimes. Most an an animals have stances, have stances or even facial expressions that can be decoded. But even the canniest, most experienced, humans know how ultimately opaque human-animal communication is. Better to wonder, wonder carefully. One of the most embarrassing and idiotic scenes I've ever seen comes in Secretariat, when the poor actress has been di directed to look into the horse's eyes and pretend the horse and the women and, and the woman are reading each other's mind, that the woman is, is inspiring the horse to win the Belmont. <laughs> there is very likely affection, but a race plan? Even if the woman could whinny, the horse still wouldn't understand her. What we humans can do is watch. I, w I was putting a canoe in the upper, up, upper de Delaware when I saw a bald eagle swoop down to catch a fish. Osprey can plunge in into the water and swim in it. Eagles can't. They, they have to lower their talons and pluck the fish out. This eagle went into the water. He or she couldn't get back in, into the air. The eagle looked around and then headed for the far shore, doing a graceless butterfly stroke, heaving itself along. I crouched a bit behind the canoe in case the eagle might be embarrassed. OK, I am subject to anthropomorphism, too. <laughs> the, the eagle made it to a rock and clambered up. I was surprised to see it still had the fish in one fist. It spread its wings and flapped once or twice, not enough to dry them. It hopped on one leg from rock, from rock to rock until it was on shore. Out of the blue, an all-brown e eaglet landed alongside, a juvenile but almost as big as the e e eagle. The eagle handed over the fish. The eaglet flew off, off with it without so much as a thank you. OK, I did it again. <laughs> I draw back. I have no way of knowing whether the eagle was choosing to go to this great length to feed its offspring, what I assumed was its offspring, or whether the effort was instinctive, an automatic pro program. All I can do is admire the eagle's recovery from the accident, admire the improvised swimming, admire the tenacity, the literal tenacity. I come across snakes once in a while. One time I stepped on an old wharf on an island off, off of Georgia. The end of the plank I stepped on began to slide. I blinked and saw that it was a water moccasin. I felt the zero at the bone. I couldn't move for the whole time the snake poured off the end of the plank, an endless snake, an endless five seconds. But at an, at another time, I, I, I was hiking in the Blue Ridge. I saw a snake rear, rear up a yard in front of me. It, it wasn't a yard long, and, and I know that snakes can strike only about half their length. It was one of the most beautiful colors I've ever seen. It was a, a, a brown, but with a kind of orange copper coming up on it. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it had just shed its skin. It was, in fact, a copperhead. It was coiled with about eight inches of its length in the air, the head motionless. We looked at each other for a very long time. I didn't feel the zero at, at the bone, just a sort of serene admiration. I have no way of knowing whether I conveyed that. Perhaps it was only be, 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 because I stood still that after a while the snake slowly uncoiled and slithered very comfortably in, into the brush. 
I thought later it would be good to learn not just to hold my body still, but my thoughts as well, to look without a babble of commentary. Another time, though, I was glad I didn't hold still. I, I was jogging on a dirt road, the same road that the bear cub was, and I heard that abrupt crackling whir. I jumped sideways all the way to the left of the road. I would have said a sideways jumping record. Rattle, jump, not a hundredth of a second in, in, in the between. Um, I, I took a stalking and tracking course with a guy named Tom Tracker Brown, who's kind of nuts, but also sort of wonderful. Uh, but one of the things that he said about how to look, he said that you let your eyes unfocus. Unfocused eyes have greater peripheral vision. If something stirs or is a variant, focus. And among the number of things that I've seen is, is a barely discernible black snake inching its way up the dark bark of a, of a locust to crawl in, into a bird's nest in, in a knot hole. And I've noticed crystallized maple sap where a red squirrel had gnawed through the bark to let the sun make a bit of maple syrup. Segway. Those two things then come in handy. Let's do the snake first. How much snake are we going to do? do? I'll, I'll, uh, we'll, you'll get the dance. <laughs> All right, we're starting. This is Elsie. Elsie, I love Elsie. But, um, uh, and so she's in the midst of a lot of turmoil. But, uh, but one of the nice things about Elsie is that she really does look uh, and put two and two together when she's out in the woods. When she's with people, she can be a little more difficult. Um, so we'll skip the whole page. And now that she just got off the phone with Walt, she might as well cut a switch and lash her own bare legs. She's in a bad mood. Out of the house, not down the hill to Miss Perry, straight into the woods, plenty of daylight left, a good hard hike until she owned her own body. Nothing splendid about this neck of the woods, close-packed second growth fighting it out for a hold in the rocky soil, a few pines pushing up fast and spindly to get to the light. She had to circle the patch of barberry, damn foreign barberry, e even more bristly and thorny than, than the n native. On the other side was a bit of surviving mid meadow, all these hills were cleared of old growth by colonists so sheep could graze. In the 20th century, it had gone back to scrub. The beautiful trees were all pets of the big houses. She felt better being sour about the woods and sour about herself. She felt even better in the, in the, in the middle of the small me me meadow seeing the blue summer sky. There were a few black locusts that had managed to grow tall on the edge of the clearing. She saw a bird flit out of a hole in, in the trunk female blue bluebird, just the tail blue. It swooped down and around the tree, then fluttered back up to its hole. It did it again, and this time Elsie saw what it was up to. A black snake was climbing the, the locust, taking advantage of the deeply ridged bark. How did the bird know? Had it heard something? Did it smell something? Had it just come out of its nest by chance? For that matter, how did the snake know there was a nest up, up, the, up there? Did the snake actually calculate that a hole was likely to have a nest in it? It was a long way to climb just to see. Or, or did the snake keep an eye out for birds bringing food back? The snake was moving slowly, in, inching up. Hard to tell its length since it was curving and recurving. -cur now on, only a few feet from the hole. The, blue, the bluebird was fluttering, peeping near the snake's head. The snake kept climbing. Elsie threw a stick at it, way short. She found a rock. It hit the tree above the hole. It frightened the bluebird more than the snake. When she watched a mayfly struggle out of its case in a stream bed and swim to the surface, she didn't root for the mayfly more than the trout or for the trout more than the mayfly. What was the difference here? Pretty bluebird, ugly ass snake? Too late, anyway. The snake was in the hole, on, on, only six inches of tail hanging out. The, blue, the bluebird fluttered up and down. Why, why didn't it start pecking the, the snake's tail if it wasn't going to do anything but chirp and flutter to hell with it? Elsie looked around the sky, ho hoping a hawk might, sh might sh show up and spy the snake's tail. But even to a hawk's eye, the tail might look like just another ridge of the soot-gray bark. 
After a while, the snake pulled in its tail. The bluebird pitch perched on a twig, certainly tired out after all that frantic swooping and hub hovering. Elsie Els wondered what it felt. Was grief a, a word that translated res resignation? Did the bird picture what was going on inside? Did the snake bite the three or four nestlings to, to, to death and then unhinge its jaw to swallow them at leisure? Or did it strangle them? Did it eat one while the others squirmed? Did, did the live ones know what was going on? The snake was successfully doing two things at once, finding a meal that it would take days to digest and a place safe from hawks, owls, or feral cats. Did it feel smart? Or was it no more reflective than a clamworm that gnawed its way down a quahog siphon, ate the meat, and then curled up inside the shell to take an armor-plated nap, predation and refuge in one move? The male bluebird showed up. The two bluebirds perched on a branch. After a while, they flew off. Had the female somehow told him, given him a warning, given a twitch of courtship that reset the nest building and mating cycle? The bluebirds were gone. A, a, a minute or two of fluffing and bobbing, and they'd gone. Elsie let that part go. She jogged back to her house, found a hammer and a flashlight. She filled a pocket with ten penny nails. Back to the, to the locust, she, she gathered some thick sticks, nailed one onto the tree, stood on it, nailed another. She climbed up and down until she had the last rung nailed just below the hole. She banged a single nail in above and to one side. She dropped the hammer held on to the nail with, with her left hand and worked the flashlight out, out of her pocket. She held still for a moment be, before she moved her face in front of the hole. All that banging and clambering might have pissed the snake off. She, tur she turned the flashlight on, used its flat face to block most of the hole. She peered in. Hard to see at first. The snake's coils were piled on top of one, whoop on another, its head turned toward the back of the hole. It didn't move, move at first, then raised its head and turned it. She saw two tiny claws sticking out of its mouth. The snake rippled, and the claws moved an inch further in, into the gape. She saw a bulge in the, in the, in the snake. Was, was it two or three baby birds? In, in the back of the hole was, was, an, was another motion, one featherless nestling still alive. The snake swung its head, and Elsie dropped the flashlight. It clattered down, hit, hitting the rungs, she, she lost a grip on, on, the, on the nail, uh, but grabbed the topmost stick. It tilted and she slid, hugging the tree with her arms, hitting one rung after another with her feet. She bumped her way down, burning her hands on the bark. She scratched her cheek on something. Her feet hit the ground, and she tipped over backward, a jounce on her ass and a slow roll on to her back. She lay still for a bit, not silly. She'd seen what some people would call horrible. And yes, she'd felt horror, and she had a moment of fright, but these were pushed aside by the sight, that intense sight that made something alien intimate. That was me. But it works much better with her. Um, but w one of the things I had to say, uh, by, by my ed ed editor said, so this is, she said, you think it's funny, but I see a money niche. I said, what's that? She said, aging men's health. And so I said, well, I, you know, they're, they're not that many, there's many pratfalls, there's medals in this thing. And she said, well, keep it that way. So there's a, prat, there's a pratfall. So now, but now, what am I doing? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. The only thing you have to know about this, this is very short. Uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, but, but it's one of my fav favorites. Where the hell is it? Yeah. So um, the only thing you have to know is that uh, uh, some of you already know this, but Elsie is all through Spartan has been in love with Dick and uh, 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 bears his child, but she wants to be better. So uh, it's a small town, so she keeps running into him. Uh, Dick's married, so she vows to stay away, but it's tough. Um, the parts of Elsie's life that she saw as her own history and geography seemed to her so much the same for such a long time that she couldn't tell the years apart. Rose growing, Miss Perry reviving, declining, reviving. Elsie quarreled with Jack about different subjects, but it was the same quarrel. Qu quarrel. Oh, yeah, I meant to tell you before I started that uh, there was this, that 
the two things that are in this are both things that I've seen, or all of them are things that I've seen, but I never put them together. That's the point. <laughs> Still undone when she would unexpectedly run into Dick. One time was so sharp that it kept jumping out of sequence. It came back to her as if it had just happened, leapfrogging what was in fact a longer and longer span of time. She was down by the docks. Spartina was in port. Dick was splicing two cables, weaving two star bursts of metal strands into a slowly lengthening joint, a bit thicker than either cable, but neatly uniform and hard. Elsie watched the splice grow, watched Dick's forearms and hands with the kind of absorption she usually felt only when watching something wild. It was when she turned away that she felt desire, not, not a sexual desire, but a desire to sense again his inmost savor. It was such a sharp desire, she felt hollowed out by it as if by fear. Another intensity that had an eccentric orbit in her memory. She couldn't tell if it happened before or after she saw Dick working on the cable splice was the red squirrel. She was sitting in the undergrowth on the edge, edge of a clearing. She, she heard the chiming note of a red squirrel, different from the chatter of a gray. She tried to imitate the sound, first by whistling, then by humming very high. She finally came close when she half clucked, half whistled in, inward. The red squirrel appeared halfway down a maple tree. It was small, even for a red squirrel, probably young. She called again. It looked around, came down to the ground, apparently didn't see her. She called again, and it hopped twice, two small arcs toward her noise. It turned its head, twitched its ears, hopped again. It was within five feet of her boots when she felt the air move. There was a blur, and then stillness. A hawk folded its wings. The red squirrel was turned on its side, motionless in the, in the talons. The hawk turned its head and looked into Elsie's eyes. She was held absolutely still as the hawk stare moved through her. Then the hawk was gone. Even by the time she got to her feet, what had happened in front of her eyes was in fragments. She tried to reassemble it then and many times later. She never got it whole. Sometimes she felt guilt. She could place it in a season only because she'd gone over to the maple tree and seen where the red squirrel had gnawed a bare patch on, on which a maple sap had crystallized. So probably March. She couldn't remember if she'd been cold. She figured it was most likely a broad-winged hawk, but it was only a guess. Larger hawks would have had trouble stooping into such a small clearing. She was a terrible witness, no details about wingspan or plumage. She couldn't even say whether the talons had pierced the squirrel or clutched it. What she did have was an instant of intimacy that was both fierce and serene, as she had had with Dick. Oh, right. I, yes, the stuff I was supposed to say at the beginning. Wait, it's not there. <laughs> there it is. I've been to a lot of reunions, uh, schools and colleges, but this is the best reunion uh, of you whom I know and who, you whom I've just met. And what a wonderful place Wyatt has found it, uh, a, a reunion with you who are here and with also the spirits many of us have known, all part of this reunion. So I rejoice, and I hope you rejoice too. <laughs>